Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Kamar Benasser, um, and it's my great pleasure to moderate this uh, very distinguished panel. This morning we had uh, a great session uh, presented by the Observatoire Méditerranéen de l'Energie on the Mediterranean energy perspectives, where we looked at different scenarios for the future uh, of the energy sector in the Mediterranean, and we were told that there are basically two main scenarios one corresponding to the NDCs, and the other one which is more ambition, uh, and this is the net zero uh, uh, scenario. So today our mission, if we accept it, is actually to see what it takes to implement it. And so we have uh, different stakeholders. I'm going to start uh, without uh, waiting. To, uh, to have Mr. Marco Berti Palazzi, who is uh, at the International Re uh, Relation and Enlargement Unit at the uh, Direction General for Energy at the European Commission. And he's contacting us from Brussels today. Marco, it's always a great pleasure to listen to you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's my pleasure and good afternoon from, from Brussels. I'm, I'm sorry I am not able to be in person with you today, but still I'm glad to have the opportunity to, to meet you and to listen to uh, this side event, uh, although in a virtual, in a virtual way. Um, <clears throat> first of all, let me salute and uh, uh, thank the Observatoire Méditerranéen de l'Energie uh, for organizing this event and in, more generally for his role in uh, coordinating our uh, energy regional cooperation. And also let me salute the other, uh, the other uh, key stakeholders of our regional cooperation. Uh, the Union for the Mediterranean Secretariat, Medener, Recre, uh, METSO, and MEDREG. Uh, so the, the topic, uh, uh, the discussion of this uh, side event is the role of uh, uh, the Euro-Mediterranean energy cooperation and the contribution that it can give to achieving the objective of a net zero future in our Mediterranean region. I think that uh, the European Union member states and the South Mediterranean partner countries are facing uh, a number of common energy uh, challenges. Uh, security of energy supply, first of all, diversification of energy sources, and uh, uh, the transition towards uh, a resource efficient, socially just, resilient and climate neutral economy. At the moment, in this moment, these last months, uh, security of energy supply uh, has been uh, the priority. It is an emergency that is absorbing, at least here in, in the European Union, uh, a large part of our concerns and efforts. And this is because of the hardship and of the global uh, energy market disruption, which has been caused by the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. However, although security of energy supply is uh, uh, the emergency of the moment, we must remain committed to our policies uh, of decarbonization aiming to uh, the clean energy transition. Uh, there are some big challenges uh, uh, in front of us uh, in particular, we, we have the, the, challenge, the challenges to achieve simultaneously uh, the threefold objective of security, affordability, and sustainability of energy. Uh, to achieve these uh, uh, three goals, we need to combine short-term, mid-term, and long-term targets and measures, which covers three uh, main policy areas. Uh, diversification of suppliers for conventional, conventional uh, uh, fuel imports, demand reduction and energy efficiency, and acceleration uh, of the transition to uh, renewable energy sources. So it is by acting in these three areas that we, we can achieve the, the objective of having uh, sustainable, affordable, and secure energy. The point is that we cannot achieve uh, 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 these objectives in isolation. Uh, single countries or even the single European Union alone cannot achieve this. We in the Mediterranean, around the Mediterranean, we are neighborhoods and close partners. 
And uh, uh, our Euro-Mediterranean collaboration in the energy field is uh, more necessary than ever today if we want to achieve these common goals. And uh, of course, in Brussels, we want to see this collaboration deepen uh, both at bilateral and regional level. Uh, perhaps you are aware of a communication that the Commission issued in February of last year, the communication on the, on the future of the South Neighborhood Partnership. And in this communication, we made very clear the point that clean, the clean energy transition is one of the pillars of the, our future relations with Southern uh, and East Mediterranean partner countries. And in particular, we, uh, we, we, we identify uh, three priority uh, objectives and energy areas of, of, a, of a common action. Uh, first of all, the massive deployment of renewable energy and uh, uh, clean energy production. Secondly, a stronger interconnection of electricity systems. Then energy efficiency, we always say energy efficiency first, energy efficiency effort and measures with a focus on buildings and appliances. And the fourth uh, that we mentioned in our communication, in our strategy is uh, policies to address fugitive methane emissions. The idea that we need, we need to improve the sustainability uh, of, uh, uh, of gas. Gas has a transition sources towards the, the net zero scenario. Have you, as you can see, these four areas correspond by and large to the area of activity of our, of our uh, uh, stakeholders that are taking the floor in, during this, uh, this session. And uh, this approach that was uh, uh, presented and launched in, in, in the communication of last year is also, I think, well reflected and given even more political strength in the Union for the Mediterranean uh, ministerial declaration that was adopted last year in Lisbon in, in June uh, 2021. Uh, in this declaration, uh, we express uh, uh, the common intention of the European Union and, and of the South Mediterranean partner countries to work uh, to uh, achieve a common, uh, uh, the common objective of decarbonization a decarbonization process that need to be based on energy efficiency, on renewable energy, and uh, on equity. On, uh, on we, 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 must, we must pay attention to make the process sustainable also from a social and political point of view. Well, uh, in a nutshell, this is the framework uh, of our regional cooperation in the energy field in the Mediterranean region. And uh, I'm stopping here and I'm looking forward to listen to the presentation of the other participants. And thank you very much for, for taking the initiative of organizing this side event at COP27. Thank you very much, Marco, for defining those key components uh, from, the, um, from the European Commission. And this is also compounded with the uh, necessity for energy security, as you have mentioned, the uh, access to energy is now becoming more and more uh, an issue, so especially in terms of affordability uh, with the recent skyrocketing prices in LNG and in electricity in Europe. Our next speaker is actually going to call us from Paris. Uh, it's Mrs. Lisa Guerrera, who is the director of the monitoring and modeling division at the Observatoire Méditerranéen d'Energie. Uh, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kamel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, offering us this opportunity to share our results, our scenarios. Uh, as uh, Kamel said, I'm in charge of uh, making the scenarios. Uh, this is the, a great honor. We launched uh, this morning, officially, uh, the results of MEP 2022, which is Mediterranean Energy Perspectives. So I'd like to share with you a few results, although some have been shared this morning, but I think to reduce, summarize them a bit uh, in the main, main challenges that they may pose. So um, starting with the beginning. Let's see, there we go. Now, uh, so the map 
has been prepared. Usually it's every two years. This year we did a special edition for the COP27 where we want to reach the net zero carbon by 2050 for the whole Mediterranean. For this, we've used our in-house econometric demand-based model uh, that uses population, international prices, and GDP. We have two scenarios, the reference scenario, which may sound like a business as usual, but it isn't because we've incorporated the NDCs as far as they are the unconditional targets that have been mentioned by uh, the countries. Now, the net zero carbon scenario we've done uh, with the help of the European Commission and the support of the European Commission, and of course, the support of all our members uh, that have helped us with data, with analysis. So I'd like to thank everyone uh, that has contributed to these scenarios. Uh, now, looking at uh, what we said before, the model is based on population and GDP and international prices. Why is that important? Because it's always being correlated to these two factors. Now, it's even more important when you consider that in the future, we're adding 130 million people in the South, just in the South, but the population of the Mediterranean as a whole. So altogether, we're 570 million today, will be more than 700 million by 2050. What does that mean? We've got two scenarios, the reference scenarios. So even using the unconditional targets, we're going to increase demand by 31% to 2050. So obviously, this is more than unsustainable. Now, mind you, it's, even, it's a bit better than 40% over the last 30 years, but only marginally. So 30% um, more. Oops. Um, but if we go for a net zero carbon scenario, we actually need to reduce our demand by 24%. So if we're considering what's happening now, we're adding 130 million people, we're doubling our GDP by 2050. So more people, more money, they're going to consume more. So if we want them to consume less and a quarter less than today, that's actually 40% less than uh, what would be in the current scenario. So this is the first hallmark. The first challenge is managing to reduce this demand. The second one you can see in this graph is we're going to have to change totally the energy mix. That means that we're going to have to go from fossil based and that 76% of our demand today in the Mediterranean is fossil based to actually 57% of being renewable based in a neutral scenario. What happens if we continue to where we're going? Yeah, sure, there's going to be a bit more renewables, but we'll still be 70% fossil based. Um, so what we want is we need to totally change our mix. And the way to do it is going to be through electrification, electrification of end users and greening our electricity process. Now, what does that mean? The first hallmark that I mentioned is reducing demand. Now we want to reduce demand by 40% compared to the reference scenario. And that means all these uh, end sectors need to be affected. And this is not just energy, actually, because when you think about it, sure, we can have more efficient vehicles, we can have more efficient processes, we can have more efficient, but we actually need to reduce the demand. And this means actually changing the whole system. If we take transport, that means it's not just getting all electric vehicles. It means we also need to get public transport, review the way we're organizing our societies so that transport is less and that's planes, that's freight. So think about this. The industry, it's the same thing. We're going, we have a lot of heavy industries in the South. We have a lot of industries in the North. What happens when you need to reduce the demand, uh, that the consumption in the industry? Uh, so same thing for residential. We need to build, of course, more efficient buildings, but it's the whole system of the cities we're going to build. And in the South, this is quite important because new cities are being built every day. So the problem is that you can't wait for 2030, 2040 to start thinking about this. You need to do it now. Uh, and for the moment, we're not seeing this happening. So this is probably one of the biggest challenges is to set now things that will take 10, 20 years to actually move forward, but we need to do it now. So transport is the one that will have the biggest need for reduction in demand and energy efficiency. But as you can see, all the sectors, and that's even agriculture, uh, that will be affected. The second hallmark I mentioned is electrification. We need to electrify the system if we want to be able to move forward to the, no, towards the net zero and diversify our economy. So what does that mean? That means for the energy mix for the electrification is more electricity. And it doesn't matter north or south, we're going to be adding electricity demand. Of course, much less in the north because the population is actually um, stagnating or even decreasing a bit. Um, but both in north and south, 
we will need to increase electricity. So in the south, it's tripling the electricity demand. So this is a huge uh, uh, challenge to face, but we want it to be green. And regardless whether it's north or south Mediterranean, we have to reach 78% of the power generation from renewable sources by 2050 if we want to be able to meet the net zero target. 78% of renewables, that's essentially through adding solar and wind technologies. Of course, there will be uh, a need for other uh, based uh, power generation, a lot from nuclear actually, um, a bit more in the, in the north and in the south, a lot because of France that's continuing its nuclear program. Uh, and in the south, we've got new uh, nuclear plants that are going to be built by 2030s, and that's in Egypt, Turkey, uh, and a bit further in, the, in Jordan. Uh, and other countries are actually now lining up to, uh, to add nuclear. Now, uh, there will still be plays for gas, uh, much less in the north at 4%, but still uh, quite substantial in the south. Uh, but this is only because of the tripling of demand that necessitates that we cannot totally get away from gas. Now, what you see in purple here is the need, uh, and we haven't really touched upon this, the technologies. Uh, for the first time, we're making a scenario where the technologies that are needed to meet the target don't actually exist in full in the sense that they're not totally uh, replicable at uh, that scale yet. So we know that we need to deploy these technologies, and one of the main ones is the electricity storage. We will need electricity storage to manage the variability of the system, especially if we're in including that much renewables. Now, um, looking at what that means, if we wrap it up in terms of CO2 emissions, well, you see the reference scenario, you see the ProMed scenario, how do we go from one to the other? Obviously, and we've said it, energy efficiency, 46% uh, of the CO2 emission reduction will come from there, 44% will come from renewables, but yes, we will need those extra technologies, we will need the green gases, we will need the CCUS, so the carbon capture, to be able to meet uh, the CO2 emissions uh, net zero. Uh, carbon that target that we've uh, set. And as you can see, it's actually uh, from both shores, we'll need to reduce our emissions. Actually, in the north, we need to uh, divide them by 15. So 15 times less emission by 2015 in the north, six times less in the south, and altogether 89% less emissions compared to today's emissions. Now, and I think uh, that's been said a lot, what now is that the forefront is the energy security. And we've always said this at OME, yes, uh, climate is important, but for a lot of countries, energy dependence, energy security is, is really at the forefront. And now I think everyone agrees, there's no question. At the moment already, the level of dependence is too high. But if we continue in the way we're going, we're actually gonna increase. I mean, from 15,000, petajoule of fossil fuel imports to 20,000. That's a huge increase. We cannot sustain it even, and that's even factoring in the discoveries that are being in the East Med. The only way forward is if we can cap our demand sufficiently to save up uh, fossil fuels and to be less dependent. You have to think that it's not just North countries that are very dependent. In the South, yes, there's a few exporters, but even for them to have more exports is, is a good thing. But there's also quite a few countries that are above 90%. And uh, for instance, Morocco or uh, Lebanon, or I mean, there, there are several countries that are above 90% dependence uh, for their fossil fuel imports. So for all these countries, and even for the exporters, there's no way around the fact that we need to go towards uh, less dependence on fossil fuels. And that's where those two meet. Uh, climate change and energy security, they're the same. Uh, fight we're fighting here. And it is it is a, a race to get there. Of course, how, how, how much does it cost? This is the big question. Uh, well, 7 trillion euros, there you have it, 7 trillion euros from now to 2050 to be able to fuel that net zero uh, transition. Uh, that means half in the north, half in the south. And unsurprisingly, most of it will go for energy efficiency and for power uh, generation. Note that for just for networks, 11% of these 7 trillion will need to go to develop electricity networks and electricity storage. Uh, in terms of energy supply investment, 70% will go for renewables. Uh, the reason why South Med, North Med is more or less the same, despite there being more uh, demand in the South by 2050, is because actually it's less costly to build from new than it is to refurbish. 
Um, now, to wrap it up, I think we've seen there are very, very huge challenges in the energy efficiency, in the uh, processing and uh, developing renewables to their full, especially in power generation. So these two are essential and need to be done very soon. Also, there's a real need to invest in technologies, and this is where there, we can have a step ahead in the region if we share the know-how, if we share uh, exchanges of, of good practices. And of course, this is a win-win with the synergies that exist across the Mediterranean, with the potentials, with the knowledge, with the nuclear, with everything. It's all here in the Mediterranean. There's a way for us uh, to achieve this, but we need to work together. I think I was mentioning, uh, I saw, uh, I was mentioning power generation, how today we have already 25% renewables in the north um, and uh, about 15% in power generation from renewables in the south. Now, when we started doing MEP uh, 2000, in 2008, and then in 2010, that was this 2020 uh, targets of the uh, commission, and everyone was saying, it's crazy, you know, even 10% in the south, that's un unattainable. Well, look at it, we're 25 and 15%, so it's doable, but only if we get to it. So I think the Green Deal was a huge step ahead for the EU and for the rest of the world. And I think if we can move forward to a Mediterranean Green Deal, we could probably achieve even more. So there's hope yet. Uh, it's challenging, but there's hope. So with this, I'll conclude. And thank you very much. Th thank you very much, Lisa. And congratulations to you and the team for the uh, publication of the map, which is uh, an another very important addition to, the, uh, to describing the potential future options. I'm going now to move to different organizations around the Mediterranean that, uh, that are uh, dealing with collaboration. And I'm going first to go to Barcelona with uh, Gramenos, who is the Deputy Secretary General for the Union for the Mediterranean. So my question to you, uh, Gramenos, uh, you've seen the figures from the map. You coordinated uh, the uh, declaration of the minister l last year for both energy and environment. So where do we go from here? Dear Kamel, uh, probably you will have a, an unusual intervention from a panelist because I'm particularly gra grateful to be here, but not because I can speak solutions, it's because I need to hear solutions. I will tell you the truth. Uh, we are in a crucial moment in the sense that uh, COVID, I wouldn't say it's finished, but the paralysis brought about by COVID has finished and we have new economic implications with that. At the same time, we have all the reflection coming from the Ukraine uh, crisis. And exactly in January, as uh, my friend Huda knows and you know, we need to reconvene the energy platforms as an organization we uh, animate and co-animate with OME. Uh, three platforms of uh, interaction and reflection on the future of energy uh, in the Mediterranean. Add to it something which is happening, that is that I sense that uh, there is money around, but this money wants to be applied in the not so long term and in a very concrete way. So what do we get now? Uh, we have uh, OMES elaborated framework that gives us a lot of uh, information. We have a declaration that has been translated into a roadmap, but there is uh, one last mile to, to walk through, because all this gives us an indication of direction. What do we get? Uh, basically, what we get is that if we really want to fully develop uh, a decarbonized Mediterranean idea, we need to integrate the markets. And then what comes out from the, uh, from the report is that we need uh, to adopt a stabilization wedges approach. I hope you're familiar with this, uh, um, uh, with this concept. Uh, basically, it's useless to uh, bet on that one macro line that seems a miracle. It's safer and less expensive also in social terms and economical terms to uh, to intake all the gains which are possible in every segment, like we have to add what we can get from energy efficiency to what we can get uh, from, uh, I don't know, societal behavior, for what we can get from uh, urban restructuring, uh, plus all the, uh, the other actions which are, which are more 
in market. So instead of uh, giving the audience uh, my solution, I'm, uh, uh, I'm delivering to the audience my question mark. Now for us as an organization, knowing that we have strengths but we also have limits, we need to choose exactly what to do. And uh, we know that it is efficient if we identify concrete bottlenecks. We do. Nobody has the strength to say, I, I take over the management of the Mediterranean uh, market and develop the new technologies, the market interconnection, and things like that. So we are trying to identify what are the bottlenecks that can be eliminated with our strengths. Our impression, and uh, I will tell you until I arrived here with a few minutes delay because I was with uh, the uh, European Environment Agency and uh, uh, we decided we should uh, do some scoping together and I was exactly asking them, we have this general picture, I mentioned uh, the report, but do you think you can help us identify on a database uh, not at the macro region level, but more territorially, where are the bottlenecks, where are the blocking factors on one, line, on one side, and then on the other side, can you, do you think you can help us identify what is the wish of the local community? Because we, uh, in all our planning, we cannot forget that energy is a choice of sovereignty. There are some uh, solutions that might be fantastic in abstract, but they might not be they might not reflect the societal, economic, market, and even political situation of a certain uh, territory. So I understand that in a panel it's strange to say I'm, I'm, I'm sharing with you the fact that uh, we have so much information, but I still miss to elaborate the last mile, which is now what do, can we do concretely to really become uh, uh, effective and uh, uh, I'm not ashamed of sharing with you this doubt, but uh, I am more ashamed of telling that uh, uh, it is also something that I launched to OME, OME as, a request, uh, as a request for help. Fantastic to have a, a framework that tells us that we need to envisage something that costs $7 trillion. Fantastic to have a methodological approach in a stabilization well, uh, wedges. Fantastic to have it now absolutely clear that this thing cannot happen nation by nation, but requires an integration of markets. But then when it comes to the choices we will have to make in January in applying the declaration and in making our roadmap concrete, uh, uh, I think we need to reflect in identifying those two, three actions that take out bottlenecks and therefore have a very high multiplier. I just end up by saying that uh, this is personal, I mean, because I don't have enough data to, to tell you for sure this is what we need. But by you know, a constant contact uh, with many stakeholders, many countries and things like that, I have the impression that the one bottleneck that has to be overcome is uh, uh, capacity. If we manage to build an overall sector capacity for renewables, especially in the south, starting from technical schools all the way to providing opportunities for, uh, uh, for forming specialized management and things like that, it's the best thing we can do because capacity is not imposing a solution but is giving the means to every community to choose their own solution while understanding the benefits uh, of it. Thank you very much, Graminos. And uh, please mark your calendars for January because we are going to have the uh, platforms, the meeting of the platforms, and we will look forward to implementing the roadmap. So th thank you very much, Graminos. Now we are going to, uh, to look at the uh, platforms themselves, and we are going to move to Mrs. Roberta Boniotti, who is the Secretary General for Medenair. Roberta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon from Brussels. Uh, many thanks for having me, me, having me in this session uh, uh, to represent Medenair, actually. 
I was in charm last week, but unfortunately today I will have to join remotely. Uh, as you know, within the Meet Med2 project, we, Medanair, together with Recre, we are committed to strengthening the implementation of energy efficiency policies and measures. And in, in this second phase of the project, we are focused on the buildings and appliances sectors that are the most energy consuming sectors in the region, in the Mediterranean region, accounting for around 40% of the total energy consumption. Uh, with the main aim to improve the uh, country's energy mix and enhance the decarbonization of the Mediterranean region. And in our region, uh, decreasing warming 20% faster than the rest of the world and the population of the southern uh, countries is really growing very fast, very rapidly. So we need to act very quickly. Uh, today, I want to, to tackle, I would like to tackle one of the four priorities that are mentioned in the EU communication, and that's our expertise as Medanair, and this is the energy efficiency field. And in particular, I would like to highlight one of the main key messages that, uh, that was launched during the Meet Med Week. Uh, from the MITMED experts uh, from 13 countries, uh, there's a call for the EU energy efficiency first uh, principle to become a global principle in our region. But what's the energy efficiency, energy efficiency first principle concretely? This is uh, still a recent concept uh, also at the EU level. And the recommendations and guidelines prepared by the European Commission for the EU, uh, for the EU countries were only published in September 2021. Actually, there are no energy efficiency first policies as such. But uh, making energy efficiency first principle a reality indeed requires a systemic approach to policy makings. And this goes beyond the classic portfolio of energy efficiency policies. But supply side and demand side resources must be considered jointly. And to do so, uh, the, the, the debate around energy efficiency first uh, principle should embrace uh, policies that are usually related to the supply side. So uh, including market design, regulations, incentives for network operators, uh, heat roadmaps and others. And reciprocally, classic and in, uh, end use energy efficiency policies that we are tackling in our project, just like renovation programs, building codes, enforcement of building codes, should be designed with their potential impacts on the supply of energy in mind. So this is um, both most of the current policies, both in the, uh, at the EU level and at Mediterranean level are not designed around this energy efficiency first principle that should be really applied. But of course, they can be adapted, uh, adapted to reflect the energy efficiency first. And its implementation requires dedicated effort from all the stakeholders that are involved in policy design, capacity buildings, and cross-cutting cooperation. So in this new uh, context, uh, the current Medanair strategy is to deepen the analysis for the future applicability of the energy efficiency first to the Mediterranean region. We are working with our expertise uh, to, to, for, uh, on a systemic approach to apply energy efficiency, to, 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 to try to apply the energy efficiency first please, principle in our countries. And while paying attention to the security of supply and the transition to climate neutrality. So we are fully committed to the UFM roadmap for action. And uh, we are ready to, to, to bring the experti our expertise to the coordinated work of the three energy platforms. Uh, because it's important the combination and working together uh, as we see that we need to tackle both uh, for the energy efficiency first, the supply side, and the demand side, uh, of course, for a cost-effective decarbonization pathway. So thank you very much, and I will uh, give the floor to you. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Roberta. So uh, I'm going to turn back to Cairo and uh, to Jawad Al-Kharaz.
who is the executive director for Recre. Uh, I will ask you the question, uh, energy efficiency first or renewable first? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, pleasure to be with you uh, today. So, yeah, very interesting question. Yeah, when we look at the, at, uh, I mean, we just, uh, yesterday, I think, or day before, we presented a sort of pre-launch of our AFIX product, which is uh, Arab Future Energy Index, so with that we produce every year, which gives us status about how far uh, the Arab countries are doing in renewables, energy efficiency, and access also to electricity. So obviously, if, when we look at uh, renewables, we are doing much more. So we have, uh, you, 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 we have seen all what has been signed recently in Egypt and uh, the, the massive deployment of, uh, of renewable energy in the region, not only in Egypt, in the, in the whole region. Probably we are doing well. We are going, I mean, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the good track towards uh, this energy transition and to achieve the ambitious target each country has set uh, I mean, to, uh, to increase the contribution of renewables in the mix of electricity. But when we look at energy efficiency, so uh, we, ha we are probably the only region in the world that where energy intensity has increased. So together with my colleague uh, Roberta, our partner said, uh, uh, in the MISMED project, we focus on energy efficiency in building appliances. And uh, during the MISMED week that we organized in Cairo in uh, last March, we delivered this mes message, energy efficiency first, because indeed we believe that uh, energy efficiency didn't get the deserved, I mean, financing, the deserved uh, priority. So we think that probably energy efficiency first, because the renewables already we are doing good, we are doing well, sorry. And uh, I think the things are on track in terms of policies, legislation, in terms of investment. But I think energy efficiency, we can do more, not only in the building sector, where we are working because building is, as mentioned, contributing to almost 39% of the greenhouse gas emissions, but also because uh, uh, even in industry, uh, when, we, when it comes to decarbonization, we are struggling. So I think uh, uh, definitely we need to, uh, uh, to, uh, I mean, to prioritize energy efficiency. And I think with all the regional uh, partners, we have very good complementarity under the, the UFM framework with the different platforms. I think uh, uh, we are in the solutions day. We need to work together. Co regional cooperation is a solution. Uh, I think uh, what we do is completing what uh, uh, others do uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, decarbonizing industrial or domestic or uh, building. This morning we were talking about e vehicles. Also another effort to be done in terms of transport decarbonization. And also with the, 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 the EU uh, carbon tax coming soon, we need to prepare the economic sector in the, in the South Mediterranean countries for this new period. A lot of capacity building to be done, awareness. So definitely uh, we need to do more, but together I think we can achieve more. And yes, I think energy efficiency first in this stage, but we are obviously uh, keen to cooperate with all the partner, regional partners to really, I mean, uh, uh, lead the region to a uh, 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 fair, affordable, uh, uh, um, a just transition but also to achieve the, the, the carbon neutrality by 2050 or even earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jawad. And by the way, congratulations on the beautiful booth that you have here at uh, COP27 and uh, the very great program of events that you have been organizing throughout the, the last two weeks. So I'm going to move to the uh, transmission system operator, MEDTSO, to Mr. Angelo Ferrante, who is uh, uh, on the line. Angelo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kamel. I hope you can hear me well. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you very much to the thank you very much to the organizers for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to participate in this event. that shows the uh, effic effective cooperation among so many uh, organizations. Uh, all around the Mediterranean, and it gives me also the opportunity to highlight some statements that are at the basis of the work that we develop as uh, METIS, so uh, the Association of the Mediterranean Transmission System Operators for Electricity. Uh, uh, starting from the concept that energy transition is a mandatory process to achieve uh, uh, sustainable growth and tackle the climate changes all over the world, and in particular 
in the Mediterranean. It is clear that uh, it requires a substantial increase of investments in uh, both renewable electricity generation and grids. And the electricity infrastructure is one of the main enablers uh, to achieve the transition because in a fully carbon neutral economy, energy efficiency is the primary instrument uh, for uh, reaching carbon neutrality. But electricity must be uh, the dominant uh, energy career. And the TSOs to a certain extent, ex uh, extent are one of the uh, key uh, driving forces. Uh, there is a strong need to develop uh, electricity infrastructure in the Mediterranean region uh, because uh, uh, there are of the limited existence of grid and interconnections and they are highly non-efficient use to accommodate the new generation. Uh, and also because there is a rather unstable uh, uh, environment for investors that's related to market fragmentation, to the lack of long-term price signals, and also to asymmetries in regulation and uh, legislation. Uh, the integration is key because it allows to reduce the market fragmentation, uh, to share balancing resources and uh, flexible operation favoring the, for the integration of renewables and also taking advantage of the regional complementarities. Uh, many Mediterranean countries are, are suffering in these days a delay in their implementation plans uh, uh, therefore, integration is no longer an option, but it's, it's a mandatory condition must be fulfilled uh, as soon as possible. Uh, we think that the, the integration of the Mediterranean power system uh, uh, is based, is, uh, must uh, be based on reinforcing the cooperation. This uh, uh, reinforced cooperation is essential because uh, the effective integration will be achieved only when uh, we will think uh, about interconnection, not uh, between uh, as a, a link uh, between national system, but uh, as a link uh, between regional or sub-regional power systems, either north-south or south-south interconnection. And so therefore multilateral cooperation is the key tool that we use for defining a, a TSO's a regional a common vision. Uh, we, we work for the definition of a harmonized uh, common technical framework that's capable to foster the development of the grid, that's the hardware, and also to define some common ground rules that the software that achieve the system uh, interoperability. Uh, thanks also to the co-funding of the European Commission, we address some necessary aspects uh, technical aspects, uh, common planning methodologies, tools and criteria to assess uh, the commercial and technical viability of projects, uh, and a shared cost-benefit analysis for evaluating the regional impact. But technical interoperability, that's one uh, of our main goals, uh, comes first, but it is not enough, uh, because regional integration requires uh, also non-technical capabilities. At first, I would like to mention the, the capacity to boost long-term and capital-intensive investments in the grids. And this is possible only with an efficient uh, financing mechanism for remunerating investments. Uh, in the MENA region, unfortunately, uh, uh, it is quite evident that there is a lack of appropriate remuneration schemes that combined with uh, several countries' financial weaknesses uh, endangers the development of the grid. What I can say from our experience, we one of our, uh, uh, let's say, flagship deliverable uh, is the Mediterranean Master Plan, where, where we assess a number of uh, uh, potential interconnection projects. We find that there are several projects that have a significant commercial viability, but suffer, uh, suffer financial gaps. Uh, the Italy-Tunisia uh, uh, interconnection is a quite paradigmatic example uh, of a project uh, that could be uh, rather mature from a technical point of view, but where we are still, uh, the companies involved are still missing part of the necessary uh, funds. So uh, we need uh, policies that must be put in place for the region and not for uh, in individual uh, countries. 
as uh, uh, the carbonization does not follow the, the, the political borders. And in particular, uh, uh, if we look at the European Union, we think that uh, uh, the carbonization policies cannot be limited to the EU member states and that uh, there must be a, a real uh, uh, development of an external dimension of the Green Deal that's key both for reaching the EU targets, but also to achieve the uh, Mediterranean integration. And uh, just, just to complete, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, the role that the European Union uh, uh, in boosting investment is uh, uh, crucial. Uh, there is a gap between policies and concrete actions that must be, uh, must be uh, filled up. Uh, but also the international financial institutions may play a very important role because any business model that you consider for developing the grid uh, should uh, assume that there is no reliable commercial flow uh, possible without an efficient and integrated uh, power system. Uh, I, will, I will stop here. Uh, thanks again for, uh, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Angelo, for highlighting the, uh, the uh, requirements for better integration between uh, North-South and South-South. Uh, we are going to move now to the regulators and Mr. Hassan uh, Osgos, from, uh, who is the director of MedReg. Hassan? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Kar uh, Kemal, uh, and uh, I would like to thank uh, a lot to OME for this very timely uh, organization. I will uh, start where our partner organization have already left. And uh, of course, uh, there are challenges and opportunities. Uh, we have already heard uh, security of supply, diversification of sources and routes, energy efficiency, promotion of uh, renewable energy are the main challenges. Interconnectivity, lack of interconnection are the main challenges. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, in general, all the partners are fully aware of these challenges and also opportunities as well. What is really missing is to act uh, collaboratively and to act together towards uh, net zero uh, emissions or decarbonization of our energy markets. First and foremost, I should say that uh, Mediterranean region probably is one of the richest region uh, in the world in terms of energy resources, not only the hydrocarbons, but also renewable energy sources. In terms of uh, uh, regulation in that respect, the role of regulators, the role of regulator, uh, regulation is key and is uh, of utmost importance. I have seen in my, uh, in my uh, past experiences. Regulation and a good regulators could pave the way uh, for a functioning, fully functioning energy markets. Therefore, uh, as MEDREC, we have been uh, promoting uh, a non-discriminatory, transparent, uh, 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 a harmonized uh, or, or coherent energy regulation with a view to ensuring uh, stable, uh, sustainable, uh, and competitive Mediterranean energy markets. In that respect, we have made significant progress. Uh, except two countries in our region, uh, all of our members have their independent regulators. They have already established their uh, uh, regulatory framework in the Mediterranean region. We are in close contact with these two countries in establishing or providing uh, support in establishing their uh, independent regulators. Uh, we hope that in the next year, these two countries will also establish their independent regulators and open the, their markets to competition. Of course, as I said that the challenges and the opportunities uh, are there. What is really missing to work together. So even with a very transparent, very competitive energy regulations, we cannot ensure the full integration or the full interoperability if we do not have a fully integrated uh, infrastructure, uh, the system operators, and not only uh, through the distribution, but through the transmission, but also through the distribution as well. 
Therefore, not only the uh, transmission system operators, not only the regulators, not only the policy makers, all the main stakeholders uh, in our region should work together or we work together or we should uh, work in parallel in order, to, in order to reach our ultimate goal, decarbonizing of our, our energy market. In this respect, again, we have started in the last two years to organize several activities jointly with our partner organization, with OME, with MedPSO, with Medener, with UFM, and with even PAM, we are planning. So uh, we have started, we, we have already noticed that together we have created a synergy, together we can achieve the ultimate goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asan, to, for highlighting the, uh, the requirement for regulation. And uh, I hope that those two countries will, uh, will finalize their uh, regulatory frameworks. I'm going to move to Huda. Uh, and um, Huda, if you could tell us, how do you see the role of the OME in the future? You have been doing uh, fantastic work in terms of uh, collecting data, but also looking at the future. So what's next? Thank you very much, uh, Kamel, and thank you to EFM for hosting us, and thank you for, for colleagues. Um, I will answer in part because I will leave it to my president, my chairman, to answer. And um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, say to Gramenos, for sure you can count on us. We've been working together, and you, you can rely on us. But I would like also to say that there have a lot of achievements, like the positive externalities that have been done since we, we've been born of, of OME 30 years ago, which you cannot uh, see, you know? But uh, if I just, uh, to illustrate this, I was looking at the indicators for the past, uh, how the, did the energy intensity evolved in the South Med countries, and they had a lot of nice surprises. And I'm proud to say, that we as OME play the role because we started working on renewable energy with the South Med countries since the beginning of 90s. But this is you cannot find, you know, in, in, in reports. And we did achieve for last year all together because last year I was in Glasgow and we presented MEP. And you know that at this edition, we, we presented this MEP, we constructed the scenario with the countries and we could not uh, achieve the uh, objective of uh, making the full decarbonizing by 2050 because there were some reticence from com some countries to say, no, no, uh, let's do it for 2060. And we are here today, this morning, we, last, we have launched the map with the decarbonization scenario and this has been done in dialogue with them. This is an achievement. We've been working closely together in order to build this uh, uh, um, declaration and I would like also to thank European Commission for the confidence because we've been, and thank you also very much to uh, Kamel who coordinated the advisory board with, um, uh, so, uh, and we achieved this also in dialogue with countries. So what we need, you have heard that all the associations said we need to more closely cooperate together, we did. Last year we had fantastic events closely uh, organized uh, all together and we will be meeting next week in Algeria to sign a memorandum of understanding to show that we will uh, make things happen uh, all together and to, so what we need is to accelerate. I think that we cannot, uh, um, we cannot wait one year in order to be closely cooperating with the countries. You have fantastic, we have a fantastic team, you have the ministries, you have all the players and we can make a nice symphony uh, working more closely together and having enough resources in order to make things happen. I will leave it to my president to say if he does agree or and what UAMI could can do further. Thank you. I, I guess that we have two minutes. So I have to adopt a sort of TV language, you know, uh, not elaborating too much. So. Uh, Two days ago, we got the number of eight billions on this planet, okay? And uh, when I have to explain the energy dilemma, I keep saying, look, we have to provide in 25 years from now, clean and affordable energy to nine and a half billion people. The next 1.5 billion people is still to come. Uh, and eventually one will come from, Af uh, one half will come from Africa, one half from Asia. 
And uh, if I look at the, all of the scenario and the, <coughs> the scenario provided for the, from OME, I can tell you that sometimes a, a, a huge headache come to me because the, the target is so ambitious and things that need to be done are so huge that sometimes, I mean, you, you, can, you can feel your veins trembling, you know? But that said, <coughs> that said, this is the rationale of all COPs. You work on all files, reduction of consumption, so saving uh, infrastructure, new sources, new vectors, just transition, financing, a regular framework. And the MED could become, and I think is an extraordinary lab. First of all, because we are 500 million in the MED basin, but we are confronting each other uh, an aging continent and a young continent, uh, a mature industrial continent which is reducing its consumption and a growing and a, and a rapidly growing continent on the other side, with two uh, demographic trends contrasting each other. I mean, with a lot of contradictions, but also with a lot of opportunities, because in this water, uh, in the water of, 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 of the Med, we have roughly. 17 18 percent of the global traffic of shipping so we are not only talking about the population that live in the countries uh, um, facing the the basin so that said in the last couple of years we had a lot of i would say good news uh, success story in energy diplomacy uh, egypt and israel uh, quite recently israel and lebanon just yesterday, the EU Commission making an agreement with Egypt uh, about hydro low carbon, hydrogen, and renewables. A lot of initiative about connecting with new infrastructure, the north and the south. So I think that even though the target is so ambitious, we have, I would say, I, how can I tell you, some, su some success story behind us that uh, could uh, keep us in a, in a very optimistic mood. My other message, uh, transition is a, is a policy-driven activity. It's not a business-driven because you need to change your behavior. You need to invest on something which sometimes is not mature. So it's something in which politics has a big responsibility. But transition will never happen by law. It will happen through partnership. It will happen through integration. It will happen through uh, sharing the same uh, goals and the same targets because you won't achieve those targets. So basically, my final message is that the format of this debate is the conclusion. We have all the platform in here, Medreg, Medener, MedTSO, OME, uh, RS3, I don't know how to pronounce it. You know, we are all here. So in some cases, we have public institutions or public bodies. In some cases, we have companies which are state-owned. In some other cases, we have companies which, which act on a private basis. The big, the big deal is how to compose the jigsaw, how to compose the puzzle. As OME, we are ready. We have been working for the last 30 years, engaging the companies from both sides and engaging with the EU institutions. So we are here at your disposal, at disposal of national government, at disposal of EU Commission, to make this job, to help together with the UFM and all the others to, I mean, make all the pieces compose the final picture. This is the best promise that we can do, but I think that if there's goodwill from all sides, we will be successful. So for the, with these very kind words, uh, Lapo, I would say effective partnership for an ambitious future for the Mediterranean. We only have one Mediterranean and we need to save it, and we need to make sure that we have uh, a very good environment for our next generation. So looking forward to the next uh, meetings in December and in January, and thank you so much for everyone for their participation.